Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Orthopod. Um, we are amidst a crisis of coronavirus around the world, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or the COVID-19 disease, which has now infected approximately 1.9 million individuals around the world, with about 120,000 deaths around the world. We're here today. We're here today specifically to chat with um, two physicians from Singapore, Michael Yam, who is a resident, and as well as Brian Tan, who is an associate junior, associate staff or associate consultant, or, or what we, or what he would call himself as a junior attending. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you for having, having us. So I wonder, um, I might start with you, uh, Brian. Can you give us um, just a feeling of what life is like in Singapore right now? Maybe a little bit of an idea of the total number of cases and what's been happening. So uh, currently we are in what uh, the government terms a circuit breaker. And I believe a circuit breaker is something which is actually used in the financial markets to really put a halt to a downward spiral. And so right now, actually, we were, we were chugging along quite well. Our case numbers were quite low. But over the last few weeks, we have seen the numbers jump fairly significantly uh, into uh, the hundreds uh, on a daily basis. And because of that, uh, the government decided to put what we call, a, they, they've termed the circuit breaker. And essentially, uh, most of the non-essential workplaces are closed. Schools are closed. Uh, social distancing is uh, now being enforced. And everybody is being encouraged to just stay at home. Uh, only essential services come out and you only leave the house uh, either to buy food or just to do your essential errands and, and you're just supposed to mix only within your own household. So this is currently where we are at now and this circuit breaker is going to end uh, on the 4th of May but uh, you know if things don't get better then we will have to extend it. In terms of numbers now, uh, in Singapore we have 3,252 uh, cases and uh, today it was just reported that uh, we had 334 new cases. Um, so far, I think uh, nine deaths so far. So that, that, that roughly is about the Singapore number at this point. Let me ask you this before I move on to Michael's assessment of the hospital system, but are, are, are citizens in Singapore um, really, really strictly following what you're calling, what we call the physical distancing ruling and you're calling circuit breaker ruling? Presume it's the same thing. Stay away from uh, individuals, uh, you know, caution, hand washing, but basically stay at home if you don't need to be at work. How, how strictly is that being enforced? Uh, so I think that, um, I mean, most people are, 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 are trying their best to follow uh, their best to follow the rules. But increasingly, uh, what they have, what they are pointing out is that all it takes is a small proportion of the population not to follow the rules. And that can really cause new outbreaks to, to pop up everywhere. And so because of that, they are trying to enforce it now uh, through regulations and through legislation. So right now, if you get caught uh, flouting any of the social distancing rules, you can be fined. And if you are a repeat offender, you can be fined or even jailed. So now they're taking this very, very seriously. So um, they, they're, they're, not, they're not leaving any room for error. Very good. Okay, thank you very much for that update. So Michael, let me ask you this. So uh, being a resident in the program, we've got lots of residents around the world who are probably feeling the same as you seeing a dramatic change in what's happened in their day-to-day -day life. So how has your life changed as a result of COVID in terms of, you know, sort of the workflow in the hospitals? What's getting done? What's not? What's being triaged? Can you give us some insight in Singapore? Yeah, um, so I would say the situation is uh, is very serious, but so far it's under control. And uh, both Brian and I work in uh, in a hospital that is a designated hospital for the COVID-19 cases in Singapore. And these are where most of the screening and the treatment of these uh, positive cases take place. Uh, and therefore, much of our hospital's manpower has been shunted to this screening center as well as uh, what we term as the National Center for Infectious Diseases uh, in the ward for the housing of these uh, this COVID-19 cases. Uh, in terms of how this has affected us in the hospital, because uh, now we have to treat these patients or screen these patients, uh, a lot of the divisions of our hospital have been shunted to help in this crisis. Uh, all divisions, in fact, uh, for example, administrative division, the medical division to house the wards, as well as the surgical divisions uh, that we are in uh, to do the screening center. And therefore, because a significant proportion of this, of our manpower is mobilized, day-to-day uh, -day running of the operating theaters, the clinics, therefore, have to be cut down. 
Uh, also, for example, nursing staff from the operating theatres are now shunted to uh, the the center for screening, and therefore there's not enough nursing, not enough anesthetist staff to uh, house hundred percent of our operating theatres. Therefore, um, the theatres and the clinics have to be reduced. And uh, in keeping with the circuit breaker measures, uh, non essential surgeries have been cut down. So in terms of what surgeries continue, that would be things like trauma cases, tumor cases, or other. Uh, uh, more urgent cases such as a neurological decline uh, or a general surgical cases, uh, whereas uh, elective operations such as total knee replacements, total hip replacements, even spinal surgeries have all been postponed for the next few months already. And uh, however, because of uh, this circuit breaker case, uh, circuit breaker um, uh, implementation in Singapore, many people do not go out, and therefore also the trauma load has also reduced. Yeah, so in terms of how this affects us as a resident, um, getting the feedback from many of my other junior residents, uh, they find that because of this reduction of caseload, uh, therefore there's also a reduction in the operative exposure for each resident, as well as the clinic exposure for each resident. Uh, in addition, because, uh, for example, if you're in a certain subspecialty posting, and you're in another hospital, then you are barred from returning to, to our current hospital because uh, you're not allowed, because you want to reduce cross hospital contamination. And also sadly for the final year residents, uh, lucky I've already finished my examination, but for the final year residents, their specialist examinations have been postponed for a couple of months. So truly it is a difficult time, even for the residents and for training. And uh, however, it's also a time for a resilience in the face of this uh, adversity and uh, how we as a as a residency try to uh, overcome this adversity would be for example residency teaching continues via online platforms and the residents because of the, the caseload is lower the residents share cases to optimize operative exposure so learning and training still must go on despite the circumstances well, that's, I mean, extremely reassuring that it's it's tough, right? And so, so from, from and I might ask um, Brian to jump in on this for both of you. I mean, you're being told, I think you mentioned, Michael, a few months. So have you getting any direction as to when they believe the physical distancing or what you're calling the circuit breaker approaches are going to be uh, lessened? So allowing people, allowing possibly the, the return of elective procedures. Is that weeks away? Is it months away? Have they given you any insight? Um, so in, in, essentially what happened was at the beginning of the year when this started, they told us to shift it back by one or two months. When we shifted it back one or two months, we were then told in one or two months that actually this wasn't getting any better and we had to shift it. So we've just received news uh, to continue shifting back our cases all the way into the third quarter of this year uh, and then and and the thing is we've been we've been telling the patients that this is just a tentative day we don't know if and when uh, these measures will be lifted uh, we do hope and and this is what the government is emphasizing that if everybody plays their part and this is what michael was saying if everybody plays their part we can get through it together can overcome this crisis and we can move on yeah. and get over this hill as fast as possible but if everybody if all pockets of people try to do their own thing, they don't want to observe social distancing, they don't want to wear their masks, they, they, you know, they start mixing around with people that they ought not to be mixing around, then this will never end and we're just prolonging this for everybody. So it's really a, a stand where everybody should play their part uh, in order to overcome this together. So right now it looks, I wouldn't say bleak per se, but I mean, I think, I think it's very conservative, right? You're being very cautious in Singapore in that no elective surgeries till you're saying roughly third quarter plus or minus so you know like september october is where you're booking into and that could still change so there's no real um the world you're in right now as uh, as a resident in your case uh michael and brian as a junior attending this is the world you're in for months now um what do you think is going to be the impact overall on training um michael do you feel that um because it's so different now and that you know rotations that are full rotations are going without any real clinical practice is this going to require additional supplemental learning or is this, or is this just going to be the world's in the same place but how do you think it impacts actual learning you don't want to prolong training just because of uh 
you, if if the residents want to contribute to the fight against COVID and uh, be posted to the screening center, but if that reduces their training time, do we then um, prolong their training time and then therefore they exit later? But many would see that as uh, something that's not fair. Therefore, yeah. I feel it is it is a time for um, for innovation where we can use different learning uh, different types of learning to achieve the same learning objectives you may not be able to operate and do as many cases but perhaps uh, by watching or by assisting or by uh, sharing the case you still get to have a significant amount of uh, operative procedures and yeah. uh, this would be the way to go forward the next couple of, uh, the next couple of months. Um, our residency has has been uh, quite reassuring to tell us that uh, they were they were not and, and uh, they were not try to extend our residency because of this of these uh, circumstances. And uh, that is quite reassuring to the resident on the ground uh, because to them, the this sacrifice they have to make for national cause uh, yeah. should not you know, should not affect them personally as, as much as we would like it to. to. That sounds good. Um, gentlemen, um, any final words that you might want to share with others uh, who you know are going to be watching this around the world and um, are probably feeling the same things you are? Any final words on your point? I I think that, that first, firstly, the, the first thing and the first thought that comes to my mind is that this is a global pandemic and we're all in this together. And I don't think um, this is this is something which uh, I think the uh, WHO uh, Secretary General uh, Ted Ross he mentioned about how you know we're all in this together. Let's not politicize it. Let's not make it about individual interests, but let's overcome it together as a country and as the world uh, against this crisis. And that is the that is really the first thing that that, that comes to my mind. And I would encourage everybody uh, to take that mindset uh, with that we are all in this together and that uh, there's no winner if uh, everybody chooses to look after their own interests. The second thing I would, I would like to say and the thought that came to my head while, while Michael was sharing about how training had changed, I actually think that this is a perfect opportunity uh, to rethink the way we practice orthopedics and not just training but even orthopedics in general. Uh, you know, when we were forced to cut back our clinics and forced to cut back our ORs, we were actually thinking that we realized that a lot of patients may not have necessarily needed to come to the hospital at all. And so even post pandemic and when we move on from this, can we even rethink about maybe half these patients never even needed to come to the hospital anymore and potentially change the way that we practice care, use more of the tele, uh, the tele rehabilitation uh, and the tele, uh, the tele skills uh, that we are forced to develop during this COVID crisis and really see how we can change our models of care. Uh, so I actually, to me, I, I maybe I'm, I'm an optimist and I, I try and see the best in the situation. And to me, this is a situation and an opportunity for us to really re rethink and relook at our processes and our models and really think about how we can do things better uh, post-COVID. Great. Thank you. Michael, any last thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I fully agree with uh, what Brian is saying. And... Truly, uh, we are adapting and our system is adapting to the COVID and, and uh, our processes are adapting. So we are changing. And um, the last thing I would like to say is that right now, lives are what is, is what that really matters. And uh, just not only in Singapore, but all over the world, preventing further spread in the community, uh, which would then overwhelm healthcare resources is what we want to to stop, and then this is paramount to the successful control of COVID nineteen in Singapore and the world. And um, therefore, we must all do our part and be responsible, socially responsible, and stay home also and stay healthy. Well, thank you both, and again, um, thank you for taking time to share with us what's happening in Singapore. And you know that. As we all do, you know, the world is standing together and uh, managing this crisis. And I think we will come out better uh, than we were before. And I just hope that the things we learn are the things we don't forget. And on that note, thank you for another Orthopod, gentlemen. Uh, have a great day.